was and then wondered about everything. Our next speaker is the perfect guide. Sami Alavi has been fascinated with uh, nature and the night sky since he was a child. Uh, through astronomy and astrophotography, his work appears worldwide. He conducts lectures, workshops, and collaborates with Nikon, the Union of Arab Photographers, Emirates Photography, and many others, including Apple, in their moon photography campaign. Many of us try every now and again uh, to take photos of the, the sky at night, as I know. And um, often, usually, the results are disappointing. Ladies and gentlemen, you won't be disappointed with what you're about to see. Please welcome Samuel Lavi. Assalamu alaikum. Hello, everybody. It's good to be here. We are all having one common language, which is photography. The good thing about it, it can be understood by anybody. All we have to do is just to look at it and try to see the message behind it. And maybe the different tongues in photography come through the different genres, portraits, landscapes, and different genres of photography. So I'm really pleased. Uh, and let us start and jump right away into our talk today. I try to uh, uh, summarize a journey among the deserts and the valleys of the United Arab Emirates and describe to you how did it start with me and how I ended up in what I am now, alhamdulillah, and the whole aspects. And I will try to mix some technical aspects as well to tell you some secrets behind shooting such targets, which might look very complicated, but you will be surprised that some of them are really very simple. It's not that hard and it's not that uh, complicated. It's just magical. Like almost 20 years ago, I moved to uh, United Arab Emirates and I'm working as a project management uh, uh, specialist in construction field. And as we know, it's a very stressful job and we need to relax every now and then, and photography was just the solution for that. I started roaming around many genres of photography. I started by photographing my kids. I started shooting everything I see nice. And then landscape, it took me a lot. I started uh, discovering areas in the United Arab Emirates, and I was really surprised to find out that there are some areas a lot of people they don't know about and it's among us. I will take you this, to this journey and let us dive in and see. The United Arab Emirates is having a really unique landscape. It might look like it's deserts, but if you look closer, you will find that there are a versatility of nature among the United Arab Emirates. I kept on uh, trying to scout for locations here and there. There are mountains, there are wadis, there are uh, water bodies, uh, uh, a lot of good places. I've never imagined that I would find such places. So every weekend, I start preparing for a trip. I look into Google Maps, and I, I start checking where I will go next. And throughout the years, I kept on looking and looking until I find really magnificent locations. And I really felt like I'm home when I go uh, uh, out in the desert and I go to such places, I disconnect from all the stresses and I feel like I'm relaxed. I'm really where I should belong. I am home. This particular wadi has taken my heart. It's located in, a, in an area called uh, uh, Shauka. It's a magnificent place, a magical place.
it is a bit poetic, but this is really how I feel when I'm among nature. I just disconnect and lose myself and rediscover again myself. Nightscapes is really special. It's really uh, uh, some kind of a, a different perspective. I will just jump this section about myself. I'll just jump into the, the real deal. So nightscapes, the moment you switch on you off your lights and look up at the sky and see these magnificent stars, and you go and travel all those kilometers until you find this beautiful scene above you. And when you discover that the United Arab Emirates are having really good landscapes as we see here, I was really impressed and I was really happy to achieve uh, uh, such discoveries in the United Arab Emirates. And the main distinctive thing that I noticed that there are different perspectives of nature. It's not just desert. There are uh, uh, some wadis and mountainous areas, a lot of people they don't know about, and there is the transition area between deserts and mountains, which is basically around the place called Maliha, the picture on the left. So those three particular terrains are what distinguish the nature in the United Arab Emirates. And even the desert, you can find different colors. You can find the white, the red, the dark red. It is magnificent. I try to focus more on the less known, which is the wadis and the mountainous areas. It's really good. It's dry. It helped uh, help me in, in achieving what I want specifically for stars. I need to go far away from cities, and this was a perfect place for me. So among the years, I have roamed around and took those small footages for the United Arab Emirates from different types of terrains. This place is called Maliha, as I told you. It's a fossil rock. You can find prehistoric fossils in that location, a magnificent place. Despite the fact that light pollution is, is crawling slowly into it, but still the place is wonderful. Winter sky, of course, is always a clear, bright night. Yesterday we were there, enjoying our time and, and stargazing. Even when the moon is rising, it adds something to the scene and light up your foreground. It is known that you, in order to shoot astrophotography, you have to shoot it and avoid the moon. But sometimes when you add the moon into your composition, it really adds some magnificent reflections and shadows on the foreground. This place is in an empty quarter, Rub al Khali, at the southern parts of the United Arab Emirates. A very dark place. Even at the horizon, you can hardly see any light pollution. And this is one of the most important aspects in astrophotography. You have to look for the proper and suitable place. So throughout the years, I kept on doing this wide field landscape or la nightscapes, or you call it whatever it is, night landscapes taken at night. And then I started to think what's next. I should develop my skills. I should look for different ideas. Throughout the years, I tried to mix miniatures. I tried to mix still life with landscapes and then I discovered that uh, in the night photography, the deeper you go inside the night sky, you discover there are some secrets and some magic behind it. The further you look, the more magical it gets. Another example, this is simply what's behind this beautiful sky. One more example in the winter sky. And you will be surprised by the amount of details and the artistic formations and the colors and the contrasts. Amazing. The other night is just two minutes describing simply moving from Earth into heavens and try to imagine what lies beneath and what lies behind such beautiful scene at night. In itself, it's beautiful, but when you go deeper and deeper, you discover that there are secrets, as I showed you. And what we will be doing today, we'll be talking about doing it the easy way. Everybody think that maybe deep sky astrophotography is a complicated genre of photography. 
when I started shifting from white fields or adding the deep sky photography into my niche, I approached the astrophotographers who shoot the whole nine yards with telescope and with the CCD cameras and all the complication. And they told me, you cannot do it unless you have such equipment. You have to drop your tripod, your camera, and start getting this heavy stuff. Something inside me told me that, no, I, can, I, I know that I can do it in a different way. And I took this as a challenge. I am stubborn at that, and I don't want just to spend my whole night setting up and spending hours losing my time in doing this. Regularly, when I go to a, a trip, an astrophotography trip, I, I take with me a, a couple of cameras or three cameras even. So I, I dedicate one camera for doing a time lapse, I, one camera for doing like still shots here and there, and the other camera I'm trying to build up this uh, proof of concept in order to achieve pro level deep sky astrophotography using only the cameras that you have right now and the fast lens and add to it a simple tracker like the one we see on the screen, and maybe with a bit of research and a bit of uh, 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 knowledge about it. And the internet is really full of knowledge. I, I gained all my knowledge through browsing and through trying to, to read about it and check what others have done. And I, I insisted that I can do this by having a very small tracker like this one, which is like five kilograms. I can put it in my bag, in my camera bag, and go there with a small USB and, and uh, uh, a charger, and that's it. So let us look at the broader scale. The entire night sky throughout any place in the, in, in the world, and specifically speaking from the United Arab Emirates, looks like that. This is the Milky Way throughout all the seasons. This is the winter. This is what we see in the winter. This is what we see in the autumn. And this is what we see in the summer. And during uh, uh, the fourth season, actually, we hardly see any, any other, anything but galaxies, and they call it the galaxy season. So winter sky, let's just step one step deeper into the winter sky and just identify the main object in the winter sky. Bernard Loop is a magnificent piece of art. It contains a lot of uh, 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 nebulas inside it and the, uh, uh, the formation of the stars, the constellation itself is very recognizable. In the we can easily recognize it by the three stars and the fifth one on the right. And you can see the names of the, uh, the stars till that moment carry uh, some Arabic names, like Beit al jawza like Rijal, like al Saif. It's really magnificent to know such facts. And when you deep, uh, dive deeper into such uh, uh, objects, you can discover such beauty and colors and contrast. Let's go deeper. This, this shot, for example, is taken with uh, a D810A and 135mm lens. And uh, a tracker, a CEM uh, uh, iOptron tracker, a very uh, entry level tracker. It's just 7.5 kgs. And what I did here, I used something called dual band filter. Dual band filter usually emphasize the spectrum of such nebulas. A little bit of addition on your, on your camera body and you can achieve something like that. The trick here is what? You have to take multiple shots. You have to take minimum 50 shots in order to reach some kind of details about it. And I will talk to you later on uh, throughout the session why we are repeating the shots and what is the significance behind repeating such shots? Why shouldn't I get the same result with one shot only? This is Orion constellation moving a little bit, a little bit further from 135 mm to 70 mm. Magnificent constellation, and a lot of people fell in love with that constellation. Orion in itself, Orion Nebula is a piece of art. It looks like a petal, like a flower. And the more you dive into it, the more magical you will find. And every time I picture and I shoot Orion, I see it differently. And throughout the years, I really uh, uh, shot it multiple times, and every time is having a certain significance to me. This photo, for example, is 8,000 seconds. Each, each photo is like 2.5 uh, uh, minutes, three minutes. 
and around 100, I think 100 uh, shots with an ISO 6, 640. The horse head, Nebula, it's a beautiful uh, formation. It's like a horse head with wings, spreading its wings and flying. And just close to it, there is a, a burning tree, the flaming tree, a magnificent contrast and uh, uh, shapes. I'm really amazed, and whenever I see such photos, I'm, I'm getting amazed. And the moment I take one shot and look into my camera and see this is promising, I really, uh, my heart keep on beating, and I feel like and this is it. So that shot was also taken around just before the COVID-19 in Ras al Khaimah and Abu Dhabi on multiple nights. A small journey inside of Orion. Going back to Earth. What I'm trying to do now, I'm shooting with multiple focal lengths. So 600 mm, 135, 70 mm, 50 mm, and I'm trying to build up a, a full encyclopedia of the stars as seen from the United Arab Emirates. I'm trying to cover all aspects. It will take me years to finish. I started like two years ago. I'm developing this encyclopedia. And the distinguished thing that I'm trying to mix the human factor and the land factor and the, uh, uh, the nature behind such foregrounds. Rosette Nebula is one of my favorite. It looks like a flower. Magnificent thing in the sky, a reddish flower. This was taken mainly in, in Al Rub al Khali and Ras al Khaimah. 180 light frames with a 600 mm lens. And there are something called calibration frames. I'll talk to you about it. And this is a trick behind the astrophotography. If you look deeper into the details, you'll be amazed about the amount of. Uh, 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 contrast uh, the smoke is having. This is actually like a big nursery of stars. Magnificent. Autumn sky, it's having different targets, as you can see. I'll go through it quickly. Lagoon Nebula in the summer is one of the distinctive objects inside the core of the Milky Way. It is a beautiful formation of colors and smoke. Still shot with a regular DSLR lens and the DSLR camera. The Eagle Nebula, we all know maybe the core of this picture is very famous. NASA shot this from Hubble telescope. They call it the pillars of creation. It's just inside the core of this uh, 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 spreading Eagle, it is a very well-known and famous photo. This particular object looks like a child coloring red, yellow, green, just a straightforward colors, magnificent formation. And it's all reflection of those stars inside it. The deeper you go and the deeper you go, you'll be more and more amazed. The core of the Milky Way in itself is a beauty. And all these objects that we are seeing in the night sky are all in our Milky Way. So this is all part of our home, the home galaxy, the Milky Way. North America, nebula, a beautiful nebula. If you go further, you can find it in the Cygnus cloud. Amazing. 135 mm, a very small tracker, like 2.5 kg, and you can just start developing such photos. Now, the sky in the southern hemisphere looks a lot different because they see different objects in the sky, and there are may maybe some richer uh, uh, targets in the night sky. Even everything is flipped around. Even the moon, it looks flipped. 
It's totally different in Australia and New Zealand rather than the Northern Hemisphere. However, in the United Arab Emirates, we are a little bit close to the equator, so there are some targets that can, can be seen from certain parts of the United Arab Emirates. Like, for example, this on the right is called Carina Nebula. Carina Nebula is very close to the horizon, very close to the horizon, and I, I had to climb a mountain and in order to shoot this particular target. Then I went to uh, even in the southern parts of the United Arab Emirates, and it was very close. This is the highest it can go in the horizon, and it's amazing. Carina Nebula is huge in the sky compared even to Orion, and it's shot with the same setup, a regular camera, a regular lens, and as we can see with this technique of stacking and repeating your frames. Looking at all of those targets together, we can start to, to sense now the distance of such uh, targets. Pleiades, for example, is 444 years, light years away from Earth. And Taurus is around 600 light years. Let me explain this fact that light took 600 years until it reached our eyes. California, it's 1,000 light years away from Earth. Orion and the horse head is around 1,500, uh, along with the Bernard Loop. And the further you go, North America is like 2,000 years away from Earth. So when Jesus was born, this is the shape of Northern America. The Seagull Nebula, 3,600. Triffid Nebula is around 5,200. Rosette Nebula, 5,200. Capo, 5,000, 5,000. And the further we go far away, the galactic core is 250,000 light years away from our eyes, and Andromeda is 2.5 million. So it took 2.5 million years until the light from this object reached us. When you think about it, you start to feel like it's insane. And those locations of the stars are actually in the past. It's not existing anymore. It's like science fiction. Even the sun, the light coming from the sun, it takes eight minutes until we reach the Earth. So what we see actually is an image from the past. It's like time travel. Literally, like time travel. And this reminds me of a verse in our Quran. I swear by the location of the stars, and that is indeed a great oath if you but knew. So it is amazing. And the more and more uh, scientists discover things in our universe, the smaller we feel and the less significant we feel. And there is a pattern in everything. All we have to do is just keep on looking to rediscover it. So what is the process? Now, let's talk some technical aspects. What is the process of doing that? Now, this is the whole nine yards. This is how you do a fully-fledged astrophotography the real way. Everybody is doing that. A heavy mount, a heavy telescope, lots of cables, and then another guiding scope, and another camera for guiding to rectify the errors, a laptop for guiding, a, power, a big power source like a car battery. You have to carry it all around. And those cables, it's like driving everybody crazy, and you have to manage the, the data, and you have to manage the cables, and you, you have to stick it together in a way, and it's like crazy. When I see this, I feel really uh, uh, frustrated. But when I look at the other aspect, keeping it simple, and insist on doing things simple, and try to get the best out of it, it can be really rewarding. So the process itself, as a timeline of deep sky astrophotography, you need some basic uh, knowledge and equipment. You need to plan your target. It's like seasons, different targets appearing in different seasons of the year. And there is a very important uh, aspect, which is the calibration frame. Let me talk to you about the calibration frame. The equipment that we are using, the camera sensors, are having imperfections. The lens itself is having imperfections, like vignettes, like the smears. Uh, uh, the camera sensor is having a noise, electrical noise, heat noise. All of those are imperfections. 
And when you go into a long exposure process, those imperfections are emphasized and amplified. And you can see the result of such in your, in your own single shot as noise. And you can see it as, as extreme vignette or color bleeding. You can see a lot of imperfections. Whatever the camera you are having, it will, it will give you such imperfections. So what should we do about it? There is a very simple physical uh, aspect that we can do, which is called the calibration frames. Light frame is a regular frame that we took with the lens open and we shoot the target. There is something called dark frame, there is something called flat, and there is something called bias. I'll show you exactly what is the difference between all of those. And there is a process, a very simple process. It might look complicated, but you shoot those. This is the light frame, a single image. This is one single frame of Rosette Nebula taken with the setup that I told you about. You, you adjust your proper settings, exposure, ISO, aperture, and you shoot. Now, we, when you zoom in, you will find random noise, and you will find a lot of uh, stuff in the image that's ruining it. The same image, you just cover your lens and shoot with the same setting, same ISO, and same uh, timing and exposure time. You will get a dark frame, but it will be an image of your noise. So you, you will record the noise only, without the light. The bias frame, there is a bias signal, electrical noise. The previous one is heat noise. This is electrical noise. And you should also multiple shots from this. And finally, there is something called flat frames. Flat frames, you have to take it with specific settings. And you have to uh, 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 expose for uh, even light in order to get the vignette map of your lens. And then you add all those frames together in a, in a specific process very easily in a software. There are also complicated softwares, but I like always simplicity. So I'm using a small free uh, uh, software uh, developed by Google. It's called Google Sequator. A very good software where you drag and drop all those frames inside the software along with the light frames that you have done, which is the basic and most important frame, and then you keep on stacking. So this is a single shot. This is a calibrated shot. You can see the difference between both. Those are the multiple light frames and dark frame subtraction. With the field, flat field correction, removing the vignette, you can see the difference between both. The contrast is even much enhanced, and the edges are beautiful. Then you do the, your first stage staging of post-processing. This is very important. You do a quick contrast and color correction into your image, the stacked image. And there is a trick. You remove the star by specific simple softwares. When you remove the star, your histogram will go down because it's the, the stars are very bright. So when you do processing with this bright object, it will be damaged. The whole photo will not deal, deal it perfectly with you. So what you will do, you will remove those stars, and you start processing again. It's as if you are mining. You start extracting the information and the data. It is there. All you have to do is just keep on extracting such data. Contrast adjustments. And further processing, you put the stars back again in the frame because you separated it with a layer with final touches and you have the final frame. That's the process very easily and very simply. It will take a time until you get the learning curve, but in a couple of months you can easily get it and you can start developing such photos. So that's Rosette. Let me give you another quick example of Orion. This is Orion along the years, along three years of shooting. And I can see that the first Orion I shot looked very, very bad, terrible. And three years later, this is the Orion. By developing a little bit of skills and techniques, you can reach a very advanced level. And don't listen to anybody who's trying to make it complicated. Try to have a proper aim and shoot for it, and you will get it. It's a passion in the end. 
and it requires a lot of dedication. You have to stand all night long. You have to babysit your mount like you're babysitting your uh, uh, photography usually. If you do a time lapse, you have to go and check it out here and there. I always have the back pain. I have to climb sometimes in, 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 in mountains. I have to go down. Many times I've, I've slipped away. Thank God I'm still OK for so far. But the deep sky objects are really uh, uh, magnificent and magical. Now I'm developing the database. I'm trying as much as possible to cover all the sky. I started with the easy targets, the most distinguishable, uh, distinguishable uh, targets. And slowly, slowly, I'm starting to build up the data with different focal lengths in order to have a full planetarium taken from the UAE, a full encyclopedia of the night sky, and a lot can be done with it. This is just a, a small journey from the moment I leave my house, my equipment, and driving, going to the desert or to the mountain. Again, my favorite place, Shauka. Even in the summer, this place looks the weather there is dry and it's nice. First, I didn't go alone. I always take my, my friends with me. I, sometimes I take my family. And then I was so demanding. I want to take more and more data. And I cannot just drag people with me every time. So, so I started to build up my courage, and I started to go there alone. All night through, trying as much as possible to collect information, as if hunting for treasures. Putting as much setups as possible to accumulate more and more data. And so on. Now, let us change the subject a little bit and go back to Earth. And I'll take you to Egypt, to a place called the Valley of the Whales or Wadi Hitan. I hunt for the dark areas all around the Middle East, trying to reach the darker place I can reach. Wadi Hitan is a magnificent place. It's a piece of history. Hundreds of thousands of years ago, it was an uh, 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 ocean, a big ocean. And there is a, 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 like a broken link of the whales. You know whales are mammals, so it used to work on the earth. So, so this, in this Wadi Hitan, you can find this broken uh, link between the fish or the whales that we know now and the whales that used to walk on the ground. So there are fossils. The place is magnificent in Fayoum, in Egypt. It's like three hours drive from Cairo. It's pitch dark, and the formation of rocks are amazing. And UNESCO have adopted this place and, and built up a, an open museum in this location. Even the structures that were built were taken from the same mud and soil of the ground in order to maintain and don't scratch the, the beauty of the place. I took special permissions and I went deeper into the valley, and there is a small uh, uh, creature there, an Arabian fox. It's a very friendly uh, 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 and naughty creature, this Arabian fox. So the people there told me, don't, don't uh, feed it, because it will never leave you. And usually what they will do, they will, when they see people, they will go down, and they will try to get close to, to get food. And then they will, like around 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, they will go up in the mountain and, and sleep. So I went on this journey. I decided that I will spend three nights. The first three, two nights I will shoot. And the third night I will just enjoy my time. I will try to meditate and look up in the sky and 
and enjoy the stars and, and all of that. And I, I had with me like a bag full of uh, uh, coffee and milk and, and water and all of that, like uh, uh, sacks of coffee. So while I'm sitting, uh, those folks sneaked into my bag and they grabbed the coffee and they sniffed it, they thought it is the food, and they, of course, they got very hyper. They have tasted coffee for the first time in the middle of the desert and become like crazy, and they kept on screaming all night through, and they just ruined the moment. A little bit further from this location, there is uh, 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 one single mountain, which is called Munfarida Mountain in the Egyptian Western Desert. There is a very sad story around this mountain. During the World uh, War II, there was a, a, a German plane that was shot by British forces, and there was three pilots on this plane. Two of them died, and one uh, uh, a pilot, he survived for two days, and he carved his name on the stone in that area. And later on, people have discovered his body, the Bedouins from the village, and they have made a, 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 like a funeral for, for this lost soul. I went there on a mission a couple of years ago, and I took some photographers, and I saw uh, his grave. And there is a small, a very small, uh, uh, lonely tree there, like a single tree in the middle of the desert. I don't know how it is surviving from where this tree is really uh, uh, keeping alive, but it is a very unique uh, tree, a very small one. I got close to the ground and I shot this panorama of this mountain and this tree. It is a panorama with a fish eye. I took just a bit of angle, different angles in order to achieve this particular composition. I can get it from a single shot, but I felt that I missed a little bit uh, 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 on the right and the left, so I took the whole frame in order to get the final image. Just a sense of the uh, size of this tree, you can see how small it is. And if you keep your tripod fully long, this is the scene, and if you decide to go down, it's a totally different aspect. The lesson here, or the message here, try as much as possible to improvise with your composition. Try to tr try different angles, and you might end up having a totally different picture. The place is really magnificent. While I was going back to the United Arab Emirates, I booked my flights in a specific timing and I booked my seat in a specific side, and I wanted to try shooting the Milky Way from the plane. And I got a test shot, and this is what I saw. I saw the Milky Way, I was really thrilled. We were very high in the, in the latitude, of course, and the clarity of the uh, atmosphere is magnificent, but I, I had a problem with the light coming from the cabin. So I took the blanket, the one that we wrap around our bodies, and I just tried to wrap it around the camera as much as possible. I asked the cabin crew to switch off the lights. Luckily, the flight wasn't full. A, lot, uh, a few people only on the flight, so I, I tried multiple windows, and I shot the Milky Way from a camera, from a plane, back in 2018, I remember. The trick here is that I cannot use the tripod inside the uh, uh, plane, so what I did is I, I just put the ISO on the highest level it can achieve without getting too much noise, and with the five seconds, eight seconds, I managed to get the frame. I took multiple shots. I took lots of trials and errors until I got my shot. Another place in Egypt, The White Desert, magnificent place. It's a national park. The formations there are magnificent. You can see a beautiful blend between rocks and sand. And arcs. This particular area, I found a small cave. I put one camera inside one cave, shooting the Milky Way after Sunset, 
and I took another angle, I put another camera there, and I ended up having this small footage. Shooting all night long from sunset to sunrise. A beautiful experience. This is the white desert of Egypt, a beautiful place. Sinai, I went there in 2019. I spent a few nights each night in a different valley. And each valley is totally different from the other. Magnificent place as well. Very peaceful. We talked about the plane. Going back to the United Arab Emirates, this shot was taken from a place called Drazin, just at the southern parts of uh, Abu Dhabi, close to the borders with KSA. There is a lonely road there, a single road without any lights. And at a particular point of time in, in, the, in the early summer, the Milky Way is centered around the, the road, as you can see. But in order to achieve that, I took multiple shots for a panorama with a 14mm, with a full-frame camera, a Nikon D800, and then sticking those shots together. This shot got really famous, alhamdulillah. And it was used by Microsoft on one of their operating systems. It was a really good start back in 2014, and it gave me a boost to continue and try to shoot more and more. Back in 2012, there was a, a, a rare incident phenomena of Venus transiting in, in front of our sun. And luckily, in, in the United Arab Emirates, it was very close to uh, uh, the sunrise, just after the sunrise, so you can easily shoot it without sophisticated filters. At that tier, I used to have a very small camera, a Nikon D90, uh, an entry-level uh, uh, crop sensor camera, and a kit lens, 7300. It was just a very primitive setup, and I got very lucky with uh, uh, Venus, and this plane just passed through and made my day. Another phenomena, which is the longest lunar eclipse that happened in July uh, 2018, and usually, when you have a full moon, you, you can never see the Milky Way bright and clear. And I waited for the moment when it was fully eclipsed, and I shot the moon and the uh, foreground and the background, and the Milky Way was vivid for only a few minutes. During that time, Mars was very close to the moon. So it looks like a jewel, some jewels in the sky with the Milky Way, magnificent scene. I, I went there with like 150 photographers. We went there, we camped there, and we shot the whole eclipse all night through. It was very long, and it was very uh, a nice experience. Wadi Shauka, again, my favorite place. Sometimes in the winter, this place is full of water. You can lose yourself by walking through the wadis in Wadi Shauka. This shot 
I placed my tripod in a specific location. I didn't change it, and I shot one shot at the night and one shot just after the sunrise. And then I demonstrated how different the day and night could be from the same location. Both are magical, but the night skies are, are really magnificent. During the winter, you can find some green grasses developing, and you can, you can really find some amazing valleys. And this grass will stay only for a month or two maximum, and then it will become brown again. A beautiful area and location. You just have to go deeper into the mountains. A particular uh, uh, water dam in a place called Wadi Burak. Wadi Burak is uh, directly at the edges uh, or the borders with Oman. So I traveled there. I went there like 150 kilometers from my house with a couple of friends. And we went to that location. It was a magnificent experience. We have encountered a snake at that day, and we were about to go back home. And then I kept on shooting. And we spent the whole night. We forget about the snake. It was a magnificent experience and location. Looking at this area from a 360 perspective, you can understand how beautiful the location is. And if you go to my exhibition, Heavens and Earth, you can put on your VR headsets and you can dive into the location and get the feeling about it. It's really magnificent. Water bodies in the United Arab Emirates during the rainy season are always full. And you can get some great compositions there. That particular pond was due to some unprecedented rain that came in July and August, the hottest months of the year. And suddenly, rain kept on lashing on that particular year, in, I think 2016 or 2015. And what I did, I just took my car and I went down the wadi, tried to discover a water pond, which will stay like two days and it will just dry. I went to that location and I, I, I just put, pointed my light and I saw lots of small eyes looking at me like, the cartoon. It was small foxes around the, uh, around the trees. Usually when it rains, it becomes humid, and those kind of creatures, they accumulate together. It was a funny situation. This fox is well known in the United Arab Emirates among the mountains. And usually when I'm sitting at night, I hear its screams. One particular day during the lockdown, I took a special permission I was really addicted to going into, into the desert, so I, I was frustrated from staying at house, so I, I kept on looking around and calling everybody I know until I got a special permission, and I went there. I wanted to shoot some time lapses without the airplanes, because you know at that point, point of time, during the lockdown, there was no flights, so I want to get this into my privilege, to my advantage, and take some time lapses without any, any kind of planes. So I went there in that location. I put one camera here to shoot a time lapse, another camera to shoot a time lapse. And then every now and then I go check up on the camera, change the battery, and doing, doing it the primitive way, and changing, uh, checking on the SD, checking anything that might happen, and then going back again. So I memorized the path to the camera, and, and I went multiple times. So one time I was going the same direction. I kept on moving, moving, moving. I didn't find the cameras. Then I kept on moving. I saw a small hill. I went up the hill, and then I saw my car. So as if I went into a loop. So I, I didn't know what happened exactly. I may, might be disoriented, but it was really strange. A strange uh, experience. Any case, when you go uh, in such places, you lose yourself. Our time is up. And I wanted to talk a lot, but I think that's enough. But when you go in such places, you lose yourself. You blend with nature. You feel like you are really home. My advice, just try to get out of your comfort zone and discover areas. Don't stick to cityscapes and that's it. Try to improvise and go there and here and there. And maybe beauty is just around you. You don't have to travel. You can find it very close to you. All you have to do is just 
uh, discover it and look around and look up in the sky and you might find uh, a lot of magical things. I hope you enjoyed the uh, quick session and it's, uh, it's a pleasure for, for me to be here. Thanks a lot. Well, what an inspired presentation, Sami. Uh, we all know the Earth is a, a beautiful place. Um, as Sami says, don't listen to anyone who tells you photographing it needs to be overly complicated. That's a great lesson, uh, message for anyone who picks up a camera and thinks, how can I improve? And as Sami has just shown us, experiment 